It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. As in this episode, we know, we know, we know how many things have gotten steadily more expensive as we go around in our daily lives due to inflation. But the big change going on, we're getting smarter maybe out of necessity, about how we're spending those dollars. I've talked about store brands forever. Wait till you hear what a difference it makes in what you spend when you're out shopping. And coming up later, the average age an American is retiring. Well, I'm going to hold that number back because I did a quiz with the staff and people weren't close to the number generally the age people are actually retiring and there's special consequences i'm going to share with you about what the average american is doing today in terms of when they bag work so forever i've had a bias towards store brands and i told the story uh, on the podcast probably four, six weeks ago about how when I was working my way through college, I was so short of money and we were in, uh, in fact, the worst inflationary cycle of the last century when I was in college and how the first wave of what are known as store brands today or private label or generics had come out in that era And that's what I lived on. And they were horrendously awful. And so not going to tell that whole story again. Just wanted to set that as a preamble. Today, that's not true at all. Uh, In fact, my beloved Costco's uh, Kirkland Signature brand is now one of the most popular brands in the world. And sales of tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars each year for a private label. And this is because they've worked so hard. They don't always succeed, but they've worked so hard at getting the quality right on having their private label and making it as a cheaper choice. Well, today, as a lot of people's budgets are being so stretched by inflation, People are changing how they shop. There are even two categories that supposedly people never change their buying habits on, that they are hyper-brand loyal, beer and cigarettes. trying to remember where I saw that story about beer and cigarettes. Oh, it was a Wall Street Journal story that the industry is kind of shocked that beer drinkers and cigarette smokers are giving up their brand loyalty to save money you know uh, so few Americans smoke today but if you are one of the people who smokes and you have stayed brand loyal know that because of the tobacco settlements of years ago there are these smaller cigarette companies have started up that have no legacy costs from the various tobacco settlements and so they can sell cigarettes much 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 cheaper than the traditional brand names. And you probably don't even notice those when you're in the convenience store or wherever you buy your cigarettes. You probably don't even notice those off brands. But if the cost of everything is just hurting your wallet right now and you're not ready to give up smoking, why don't you try a pack of one of these off brands and see if you like them enough to ditch your brand that you're loyal to because we're talking about big money for a pack-a-day smoker you can save if you switch. Um, obviously, you save the most if you quit. As a former two-pack-a-day smoker, I can tell you uh, that I'm really glad I quit from my health and my wallet. How but, long ago did you quit? So, I quit in the 1970s. Oh, okay. See, a lot of people don't realize I'm ancient. You know, <laughs> I'm as old as Methuselah. But anyway, I, yeah, it I, wasn't a long-term habit. That's it, awesome. it was multiple years. Yeah, because I know this is this is just hard for people to imagine 
but I started smoking as a single digit. Wow. Um, cigarettes were just everywhere yeah. when I was a kid. And did either your parents smoke? Both of them smoked. Yeah. Both of them smoked. Uh, you know, in our house, there were uh, boxes, cigarette boxes, all over the house. And my mom was very social, so she entertained a lot. So there were all these different brands of cigarette pa- cigarettes wow. around our house in these boxes. And so people could go around and pick out their favorite cigarette and smoke it. It was just the way things were done. Mm -hmm. And so I remember um, when I lived in Maryland, I used to go to Virginia to buy cigarettes because they were so much cheaper. And I'd pay $2.89 a carton, 29 cents a pack back in those days. And you think about how much cigarettes are now. People pay that much per cigarette a lot of times when you figure out the cost per pack. So it has a much bigger effect on your budget. But this was not supposed yeah, to be a smoking Yeah, and hopefully that's pot. a tiny, tiny percentage of the Well, listeners. the percent of people who smoke, adults who smoke, keeps going down, 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 down. But uh, people, do you know socially, I can't believe we're still talking oh, about this, okay. but socially... Uh, people who smoke tend to gravitate. Their friend groups tend to be people who smoke as well. Sure, because other people don't want to be around you smoking if they're not smokers too. Maybe, maybe so. So the beer thing, less controversial, right? Well. Um, <laughs> oh, you think beer is controversial? Sure. Well, alcohol is oh. very bad for you too. So we're talking about. Cancer, uh, all that stuff, yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Well, anyway, people are trading down in beer and uh, they're saving a lot of money doing that as well. But then you go to things you buy in the supermarket or whatever, sales of the private label are way up. And I have some stats here, how much more it is buying the brand name. Certain brand names are much, much more money. Like one of my favorites is the thing that so many people got upset with me about what I did with cereal boxes with my kids. Mm-hmm that Kellogg's is generally almost 60% more per ounce than the generic cereal, the store brand cereal. And so these are things that if you think about, oh, typical, by the way, you you pay, uh, you save 30% if you buy store brand. Some categories, the difference is greater. But if you just think about trying a store brand and most stores on the box say hey if you think this tastes like sawdust bring it back on your next visit and we'll give you your money back or we'll give you the brand name free or whatever they want so badly to get you to sample the store brand and it just saves you so much money and the store makes more money if you buy their brand instead of the national brand Uh, another category candy you know most brand name candy is hugely more expensive about 50 60 percent more expensive than the store brand version of candy sometimes the store brand version of candy not so great but uh there there are so many categories where if you look on the shelf the price difference for you and your wallet between that store brand and that national brand so 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 big You should really take a chance on that store brand, especially right now. Yeah, and especially with, all, I would say also, like, if you're buying, like, lotions or medicines, things like that, over-the-counter stuff, the generics are so much cheaper, too, and they basically have to be the same, right? They have to be. So the OTC meds have to be identical. I mean, they are the same. Just like if you buy um, prescription meds. Mm Mm-hmm. And you buy the generic. Everybody is comfortable pretty much buying generics if a generic's available because the price difference is so gigantic with prescription drugs. But for some reason, when we go to buy the -the (laughs) over-the-counters, some reason, I know the reason. I mean, how many ads have people seen over their lifetime for Tylenol or um, Advil Advil. or any other uh, brand name pain reliever and when you got a headache you want to be certain it's going to work right so you feel this 
th- thing that, well, it's got to be better. My headache's going to get better if I buy in- extremely overpriced Tylenol or extremely overpriced Advil. That's my add-on mm-hmm. in there. And don't do it. Don't waste the money. It's your money. It's better in your wallet than it is in that register. All right. Well, the first question is also about saving money. This is from Taylor in Kansas. Why don't you recommend Amazon Music? I heard on the most recent episode I listened to that you're a fan of the ad-supported Pandora, but Amazon Music is free without ads for those with Prime. This is an incredibly useful free service that I don't think people are aware of. I catch plenty of flack from my friends for being the only person they know of that uses Amazon Music, but hey, it's free. Okay, so Taylor, you're a kindred spirit with Joel, who used to be a producer on my radio show, because Joel was obsessed with Amazon Music. And every time I would talk about music, he'd say, why don't you talk about Amazon Music? So you've done it. You've reminded me. And we reluctantly still have Amazon Prime, which I don't want to have anymore. But my family, anyway. uh, So uh, I will download Amazon Music and I will try it. Because I've been listening to Pandora on the weekends. You know, for T-Mobile subscribers, Pandora is ad-free for free. And so I'm always happy when it's uh, the T-Mobile summer weekend and I can listen to Pandora for free. So obviously I like listening to music without the ads and not paying for it. So I will download the Amazon Music and give and it a try. And it's technically not free. You have to pay for Prime, but yes. Well, yeah, but if you're already yes, if you're a Prime stuck member. paying for Prime. Now, there's a reason that I'm happy that I'm stuck with Prime. NFL football, Thursday night uh, football this year is uh, an Amazon Prime thing. Awesome. Okay, Patrick in North Carolina says, Clark, I have a teenage son, he's 14, and have been looking at the Fidelity Youth account as a way to start teaching him a little more in the way of savings and investing. He already has a savings account with our state credit union, but I was was thinking this might be an extension of that. My question is, how would an account like the one provided at Fidelity or others, if there are any, affect a student loan application in the future for college? Uh, It's a bummer, Patrick, because... Also, that savings account at the credit union affects uh, student aid eligibility. Here's what happens as a general rule of thumb. A parent is expected to give approximately 5% of their assets towards a kid's college education each year. A student who has money in his or her own name is expected to spend roughly a third of that towards their education each year. So money in a kid's name has much greater impact at reducing eligibility for financial aid than money in a parent's name. So Patrick, if you're talking about having substantial money in a Fidelity account, it would have big impact on your son's eligibility for financial aid. If it's a smaller account just to teach the basics of investing, allow your 14-year-old son to be able to learn how ETFs work, index funds work, how basic investing works, how building a portfolio and asset allocation work, the Fidelity Kids account is fantastic because the kid actually has discretionary control over it, which gets a kid much more psychologically invested in the investments than if it's just like, they don't they know there's an account there and it's kind of out there but they don't really have any say so so big money in it any big money in a kid's name before college uh, is risky in terms of qualifying for financial money? aid what would you consider big money well okay so your daughter's college 83,000 this year yep my daughter's last year of college was actually the same 83,000 I mean, if, if your kid's going to a hugely expensive school, then we're talking probably different numbers. But if you're going to a typical uh, college education cost at a state school, I would say any amount in that Fidelity investment past 5000 would be a problem. Your 14-year-old, if he starts working next year at a traditional job, money would best be put with Fidelity and a uh, custodial Roth IRA because Roth money does not count 
in the formulas qualifying for financial aid. And this is from John in California. I believe many years ago you recommended still getting paper statements in the mail and not getting email statements. Your belief was that if something went wrong, banks and credit card companies could not argue against something they printed and had their logo on. I've kept this advice, but I'm now curious if this is still something you recommend. So I can't believe you're asking this question, John. You don't know this, Krista. Yesterday, I was having a conversation with a banker about this very topic. Oh, wow. Saying, hey, do you still do all paper statements? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, so do I, because I know what happens with our systems. And I'm wow. like, oh, man. I thought that was funny. But we have had people who said what they do is they've gone to e-statements and then they download an electronic file so that if uh, we get attacked by a state actor that brings down our uh, the computer systems and you're having to reestablish what you have and all that, that having an electronic record like having a backup, a digital backup, uh, many people believe that it is just as good as having the actual paper statement, then you don't have the blizzard of statements mm -hmm. and you don't have to cut down all those pine trees to make all <laughs> that paper. But um, that only works if you're storing locally on your own hard drive or a, um, what do you call those, portable hard drives? Yeah, or just a little um, USB Zip stick. Zip drive, something yeah, like that. Just a little. So you, you don't want to store solely in the cloud mm -hmm. because what happens if AWS, the largest cloud storage, or, or Google or Microsoft, they're attacked by a state actor and you can't get to your cloud files, having your own backup at home. And we talk about this, you know, having, uh, because the time will come as part of modern warfare, they're going to attack our electrical grid. They're going to attack our computer networks. Um, all these things will be under attack. And that's why I want you to have the, the emergency supply of cash. I want you to have an emergency supply of food and water to carry you through, not for six months, two weeks. Two weeks, because societies adjust, but you need that buffer for those couple of weeks. And having your own local backup of your records and not just relying on the cloud is very valuable. Well, didn't mean to make you freak out about what the what might happen with a foreign actor or something like that, but it's just something you got to prepare for. Something else you got to prepare for? Retirement. And I want to tell you something, new report, what age the average American is retiring and why that actually terrifies me. There's a new Gallup survey that uh, polled what age people retire. And it turned out the average retirement age for the average American worker is 61. Now, lifespans have steadily been increasing. We've had a decline recently because of losing, sadly, a million and a half people in the United States to COVID. But that is a temporary statistical anomaly. The reality is Americans, as people around the world, are living longer lifespans. And once you reach age 60, you're likely to live uh, potentially another 27 years, I think, on average, something like that. But you got people that will live well beyond that. The number of people living beyond 100 years of age keeps going up, up, and up. So you start working, let's say typical person starts working sometime between, full-time, between 18 and 23. And then you work for, if you quit working at 61, basically you got a 40-year work cycle. So then if you happen to be someone who lives a long, 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 long time after that, and you approach age 100, you're talking about years in retirement roughly equal to or just a little less than years in the workforce. That sounds pretty great, right? I mean, half your adult life you're working, half your adult life you're um, enjoying leisure, if only, because 
Here's the thing about retiring at 61. There are people who are fortunate enough or industrious enough, lucky enough, whatever term you want to use and whatever the circumstance is, that you can retire even potentially earlier than that simply because you worked at one of the very rare corporations or you work for a government agency where you have a pension that allows you to have enough income that pretty much is equal or close to what you earned in the job and you can live the rest of your life without ever having to work again. Okay, so how many of us are in that position? Somewhere about one in 10. The pension that used to be so much a part of American work life isn't there anymore for almost anybody. So how are you going to do the other? You could own your own company, and that is the greatest path to financial security that exists. To be an entrepreneur, uh, have success in your business, doesn't have to be uh, something where you end up being uh, one of the tech bros with billions of dollars. It could be something where you just earn a decent living, you're stashing money away, and you reach a point where you sell your business to, to somebody else or your kids take over, and you can retire and retire at a young age. But you start looking at the situations. It could be somebody who's a max saver, somebody who's part of the FI movement, financial independence, and you're living on less than what you make substantially your whole working lifetime, and depending on what percent of your pay you're saving, you could even bag work in your 40s, more likely in your early 50s. You could do that. Again, these three circumstances, there may be something else I'm missing, a different scenario, but it still accounts for a sliver of the population, maybe 25% of workers. Other 75%. You haven't been in a position, you've been able to save a great deal of money, you don't have a pension, and you're not even eligible for Social Security yet at 61. And how are you going to provide health care till Medicare starts at 65? So I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer here. I'm trying to be realistic with you that a mistake so many people make is you burn out at work and you can't wait to never go into work again. And you think, well, I'm probably okay, and you quit. And then you're you're not even young old yet at 61, and you're not working. You think, this is great. I can go to the golf course. I can travel. I can do whatever. Do whatever I want. Get in the camp or go around. Always wanted to see the 50 states, whatever it is. Well, in the camper, you're only going to see 48. But anyway... I guess you could stretch it to Alaska, but that is a tough drive through Canada to get to Alaska. So you get later in life and you don't have enough money. And then you're not young anymore. And you might be uh, not so healthy. You might be feeble. You might be ill. And you don't have money to live on. That's why every additional year you can delay in your 60s remembering that you may be around with us for many decades after you bag work getting some extra years in so you can build up more savings you can reach the point where you qualify for medicare and if you're willing to do what I'm about, which is wait till age 70 to take Social Security, it means that if you live to 100, you live to 90, uh, you live to 85, the Social Security check you're going to get is going to be so, so, so much larger than it would have been otherwise. So I'm not trying to uh, rain on your parade. I just want you to have a parade that will last. I don't want it to be a parade that you run out of floats too soon. Krista? The first question Always mess here. up those analogies. Was that one okay? No, that was fine. Okay. <laughs> Kathy in Maryland said, Hello, I'd previously placed a freeze with all three of the credit bureaus. We decided to p- apply for a HELOC, so I had to unfreeze my credit. 
Within a day or two of unfreezing my credit and applying with our local credit union, we were inundated with calls from lenders. I'm thinking this can't be a coincidence. Can you tell me how this could happen? Sure. Okay, so Kathy, how the credit bureaus make their money? Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian make their money developing these dossiers on you that you didn't ask for, packaging you, slicing, dicing, and then making money selling off your information. The second you thaw your files and you did an initial application for a HELOC, all three credit bureaus were immediately selling your leads to financial institutions, banks, and non-bank lenders that wanted your business. And so you may receive, uh, over the next few months, hundreds of solicitations. And the credit bureaus know so much about you, and data miners do. You'll get emails. You'll get uh, traditional mail. Uh, you may even get text messages because they know your phone number in many cases. And so this is all about the extremely invasive credit reporting system we have in the United States. This is from Eric in North Carolina. Our daughter goes to university out of the country. She has a credit card with no junk fees for the currency exchange, so that's fine. But when we make larger payments to the university for tuition and housing, we don't want to pay the credit card convenience fee they charge. So we use wise.com to send and exchange money to her, and then she pays the bill in the local currency. Do you know of a better option? So wise is very wise to use. Uh, it used to be called TransferWise when I first talked about it years ago and wasn't even available in the United States yet. I remember when it started, I, if I remember right, it's a British company. And when I talked about them the first time, I was like, this has got to come to the United States because our banks rip people off so badly on foreign currency exchange. In fact, uh, our foreign currency rates from our banks the, are the worst in the developed world. And so, uh, it, and you know, I love to pick on the big banks, but the reason for it is actually a practical one. We're in such an unusual position in the United States that it's such a large, large, large country landmass. Uh, we share uh, just borders with two other countries. We have a massive population, and our market for foreign currency exchange is so tiny that it's almost like a specialty function here in the United States. And so the banks uh, treat it as kind of like an ancillary thing and rip us off to the end of the earth. Never, 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 not ever exchange foreign currency with a bank in the United States unless you hate yourself. So WISE is one of several foreign-based uh, money transfer outfits, exchange outfits, et cetera, that are great deals particularly compared to what we have available to us. Uh, Wise is probably the biggest of these players that are heavy discounters. And from Sean in Colorado, Clark, we are selling our house in Colorado and moving back to Wisconsin. Selling items is very frustrating on Facebook Marketplace because of the likely scammers, many wanting us to accept Zelle. What can we do to deal with legitimate buyers and not scammers? This is hard. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is a real problem with Craigslist, used to be mainly a Craigslist thing we would hear these questions about. And because of the market share of Facebook, we hear about this problem with Facebook a lot more with the scammers. And you're selling stuff. So dealing with people local in your area and having them come pick up stuff and pay at the time is one of the safest ways to do it rather than entering into a deal with an unknown entity hiding behind an email address. Uh, some people like uh, Nextdoor is a way to do it. I'm not familiar it's with It's basically like you list things on Nextdoor, but you have to prove that you live where you do for Nextdoor, so it's a little better. Something I've seen people do on Facebook Marketplace, and then I there are Facebook exchange groups usually for different cities and neighborhoods, so you might want to look into that, Sean, so you know they're actually local is in their listing, they say, I don't accept Zelle, I don't accept anything, I only go through this, so that maybe it eliminates some of those people from contacting you. 
Um, the Zell problems continue in my news feed uh, every single day. There are TV stations and newspapers local around the country that do stories every single day of the year about how people get ripped off by Zell. Zell is poison to your pocketbook. Do not use it to pay for anything. Do not use it to accept money from anybody. It is a curse on all of us, and the banks don't care. So that was my <laughs> that was my sermon about <laughs> Zell for wow, the day. It's heavy. And uh, by the way, oh, on the Zell thing, you know, the feds are considering. Uh, actually, they're implementing a crackdown on the horrific bank misbehavior involving Zell. Banks just don't seem to learn. And the banks are defiant in response to the actions the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is taking to protect consumers in this area. And I don't understand what goes on in the corporate offices of a big bank that they are so heartless, cold, and cruel that they either are clueless or just don't care about human beings. Because the Zell thing is a horrible, horrific mess. Remember, Zell equals poison. Think of it that way. Would you say, oh, there's skull and crossbones on something. I want to drink it. Think of Zell that way to protect yourself. This poor guy who works at my gym, he's awesome and he just started his own business and he was so excited to tell me that he set up accepting payments through Zell. <laughs> <laughs> I was have, like, let's go to YouTube and you search Clark Howard Zell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have rental properties, and uh, a tenant asked if I wanted him to pay. A new tenant asked if I wanted him to pay rent through Zell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Okay, anyway, anyway, want you to know that we are here to help you against the bad guys, to help you against the clueless people. And to help you have the knowledge and power to take control of your life and your wallet. And we do this as well online, Clark.com and ClarkDeals.com, serving you every day of the year so that you have a better, smarter wallet and that you buy the best deals on things that pop up every day.